Today I'm going to be talking about pulmonary hypertension and my objectives are to talk to you about what is pulmonary hypertension, what are the basic concepts around pulmonary hypertension, then we will talk about classification of pulmonary hypertension with a specific focus on imaging for pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is defined as a condition where the mean pulmonary arterial pressure is more than 25 millimeters of mercury. The mean pulmonary arterial pressure is not the same as the systolic pulmonary arterial pressure which is recorded in echocardiography. The systolic pulmonary arterial pressure is usually about 10 millimeters of mercury more than the mean pulmonary arterial pressure. A pulmonary arterial pressure of up to 30 millimeters of mercury is considered as mild, 30 to 50 is considered as moderate, while anything more than 50 is considered as severe pulmonary arterial pressure. As the pulmonary arterial pressure increases, there is progression of RV failure, which eventually leads to death. Also, remember that pulmonary arterial hypertension is not the same as pulmonary hypertension. Instead, pulmonary hypertension is a large group of disorders within which one classification is pulmonary arterial hypertension. Let's talk about classification. Well, in a general sense, you can classify pulmonary hypertension based on the level of pathology. If the pathology is between the heart and the capillary blood, it's called as a pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. This is seen in pulmonary arterial hypertensions and also chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. In this condition, the pulmonary vascular resistance is more than 3 wood units, while the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is normal. On the other hand, if the problem is beyond the capillary into the pulmonary venous arena, then it is called as a post-capillary pulmonary hypertension such as left heart failure which can lead to secondary pulmonary hypertension. In this condition, the pulmonary vascular resistance is normal but the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure increases. Now, there is also an entity where there is a mixed pathology where you've got both pre as well as a post-capillary component but the important thing for you to remember here is when you're looking at a catheter angiography data or if you're looking at a patient's clinical notes and they say that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is normal, then you're looking at pre-capillary pathologies. If the capillary wedge pressure is increased, then you're looking at a post-capillary pathology for pulmonary hypertension. A more recent way of classification of pulmonary hypertension which was uh, suggested by the WHO is shown here whereby the causes of pulmonary hypertension are divided into five groups. Group 1 is called as the pulmonary arterial hypertension. Group 2 is related to left heart disorders. So this becomes a post capillary pathology while this becomes a pre capillary pathology. Group 3 is related to lung abnormalities or pathologies which cause hypoxia in the patient. Group 4 is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, while group 5 is a combined mixed bag where there are multifactorial abnormalities. Amongst all of these groups, the group 4 is very, very important because this is a treatable cause of pulmonary hypertension and we can actually do wonders in the management of these patients. The role of imaging is multifactorial when it comes to pulmonary hypertension. First and foremost, we need to diagnose the presence or absence of pulmonary hypertension in these patients. Once we have diagnosed it, we need to be able to assess the severity of pulmonary hypertension, which is then followed by looking for the cause of pulmonary hypertension. So every imaging modality that we are considering has to go through all of these steps. Once you have looked up for the cause and you've started treatment, you are using a modality of imaging for following up of these patients to see the progression of disease. All along, you're looking at imaging to guide 
prognosis of these patients so we know which patients are likely to do better and which patients will need more intensive therapy. Different imaging modalities are available for assessment of patients with pulmonary hypertension, starting with a chest radiograph and echocardiography, which are done in almost every patient with suspected or known pulmonary hypertension. I'm going to focus more today on cross-sectional imaging, especially the CT components for pulmonary hypertension. MRI has got very promising results and is likely to become the modality of choice for imaging every patient with suspected or known pulmonary hypertension. And I will speak about this for a few seconds towards the end. Nuclear medicine, SPECT and ventilation perfusion scans are also very useful in assessing pulmonary vascular flow, especially in pulmonary hypertension patients and looking for shunts to assess which kind of pulmonary hypertension the patient suffers from. Catheter angiography continues to remain the gold standard in assessment of severity of pulmonary hypertension, but because of its invasive nature, is actually not performed that often. In the same setting, if you look at the recommendations, one would say that all patients should undergo echocardiography, a CT pulmonary angiography, or even a dual energy CT angiography with perfusion of the lung scintillation studies. Again, if you're suspecting liver disease, ultrasound of the liver with Doppler studies is very, very important. Congenital heart disease, left heart disease, both CT as well as MRI are extremely useful. If you're looking at hypoxemia or CTEF, you start looking at cardiac MRI scan for Q flows, you're starting to look for lung ventilation studies, etc. I like to talk about pulmonary hypertension to radiologists because we find many cases coming to our institute as idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, meaning that an imaging has been performed and no diagnosis could be established. In about 60 to 70 percent of such cases, we actually do find a cause of pulmonary hypertension and correct therapy can be instituted in these patients. So I want you all to develop a very standard approach when you're looking at these cases. I'm going to show you some examples. Remember the classification system and every time you go through a case, you start thinking, is this X? Is this Y? Can I exclude Y or can I exclude Z? Before you say that, there is pulmonary hypertension without any cause. So if I am seeing around 100 cases of pulmonary hypertension, in almost 80% of these cases, I am finding a cause of pulmonary hypertension. About 20% of cases, I do not find a cause of pulmonary hypertension. Once you are seeing a CT with suspected pulmonary hypertension, the first thing is to look at the size of the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery of larger than 2.9 centimeters or MPA being larger than iota is suspicious of pulmonary hypertension. Look at the same time into the size of the right ventricle in relation to the left ventricle. RV should not be larger and the interventricular septum should not be straight. If these two features are seen, this is suggestive of pulmonary hypertension. Look at reflux of contrast into the hepatic veins which suggests that there is tricuspid regurgitation, another feature of pulmonary hypertension. Once you have seen that, then you start a stepwise approach of looking at the scan. First thing is to look at the pulmonary arteries. Look and see if there is any acute or chronic thromboembolic disease. Secondly, look for any abnormal communication between the pulmonary arterial and the venous chain for any of the fistulas. Then you look at the pulmonary veins. Make sure that they are all draining normally into the left atrium and there is no partial or total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Then look at the heart. You're looking to make sure there is no ASD, there is no VSD and there are no other features of RV failure such as RV dilatation or straightening of the interventricular septum. 
make sure there is no PDA that has been missed and then you start looking at lungs. Look for emphysema, look for interstitial lung disease, look for any pathology that can explain hypoxia in these patients. Make sure you've looked at the liver of these patients because cirrhosis can also cause this pathology. Look around the esophagus to see if there are any venous collaterals or portosystemic shunts which will explain pulmonary hypertension and look at the vertebra in terms of hematopoiesis which can be seen in patients with thalassemia or sickle cell disease which can also cause pulmonary hypertension. Let's go through each of the groups and see what are the examples within one group. So the group one is that of pulmonary arterial hypertension which has idiopathic pulmonary hypertension but what we are more interested are in cases of shunt. So this is an ASD. You can see another patient with ASD. This is a patient with VSD and this is a patient who's got anomalous pulmonary venous return. So these are congenital heart diseases which form part of group 1. Another congenital abnormality is seen in the lower abdomen where you can see in this case that IVC has an abnormal drainage of the portal vein whereby there is a portosystemic shunt so all the impure blood from the abdomen actually bypasses the liver into the right heart into the lungs which leads to multiple fistulas at the capillary level called as Abernathy syndrome and another cause of pulmonary hypertension. Commonly also seen are cirrhotic features in the liver with ascites and photosystemic collaterals. These can also be a cause of pulmonary hypertension. Look for any of the AV malformations or shunts which can explain the pathology. Also look for connective tissue disease features. So this is a patient who's got scleroderma and you can see that the esophagus is grossly enlarged in this patient and when investigated they were suffering from systemic sclerosis. One important pathology that most of us may not see often in our lifetime is called as pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis and pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. One thing to look for every case that you see with pulmonary hypertension are these septal lines. These septal lines are features of venous problem and not a feature of pulmonary hypertension. So if you're seeing lungs with ground glass changes and septal thickening, think about pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis or PCH or look for the venous system and see if there is any occlusion in the pulmonary veins when we look at PVOD or pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. The second group is about left heart dysfunction. So this is a patient who's got a dilated cardiomyopathy with diastolic dysfunction which leads to back pressure into the LA and the pulmonary veins which leads to pulmonary hypertension. Another patient who's got thickening of the mitral valve leaflets in keeping with underlying mitral stenosis. Group 3 pathologies are features of lung diseases such as interstitial lung disease where you can see in this case extensive honeycombing and fibrosis while this is a different case who's got severe emphysema. All of these account for hypoxia and can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Group 4 pathology is something I'm very much interested in which comprises chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. It is very easily missed on CT imaging if you are not looking for it. Chronic thromboemboli are actually seen as webs of filling defects within the vessels. Sometimes the entire vessel itself is missing and we may not actually track it. So look at every segmental branches when you are looking for CTEF or chronic thromboemboli in these patients. So we'll run through this video again when you see here, especially look at the left lung, what you will start seeing is this is a dilated pulmonary artery and as you can come down in the left lower lobe, you'll start to see these webs and flaps in the patient in keeping with CTEF. This is the cath angio of the same patient and what you can see are these 
areas of webs or narrowing which can also be nicely demonstrated to us on our 3D MPR views of this patient. This patient also underwent a dual energy study where you can see reduced perfusion in the left lower lobe while there were patchy areas of reduced perfusion in the other lung also in keeping with CTEF. The management of this is surgery or pulmonary endarterectomy and you can see these are the clots which are present within the pulmonary artery which can be taken out during surgery and the patients do extremely well after surgery with significant drop in pulmonary pressures. Please do be aware of some of the pathologies which can mimic as uh, CTEF. For example, this was one patient which we thought was chronic thromboemboli. To begin with, we thought it was acute embolus. He had thrombolysis, nothing changed. And over the follow-up, it remained pretty much same. We thought it was chronic pulmonary thromboembolism, but it turned out to be a pulmonary angiosarcoma. This is another cause of pulmonary hypertension. The last group is that of pulmonary hypertension with multifactorial mechanisms whereby you're looking for cystic lung diseases you know, such as Langerhansel histiocytosis, uh, LAM which can cause this uh, pulmonary hypertension and metabolic disorders such as thalassemia or chronic anemia can also lead to pulmonary hypertension. MRI is fantastic in uh, giving us a lot of data functional data in patients such as the right ventricular volumes, the right ventricular function, the ventricular mass index to assess the degree of RV hypertrophy and also to help in assessing the reversibility of pulmonary pressures in these patients. The pulmonary transit time is another feature to assess the function of the RV. The QP by QS or the flow within the pulmonary artery compared to the flow within the systemic circulation helps us in assessing the shunt in congenital heart diseases. If you look at this one patient, this patient came in with acute pulmonary embolism and at that time you can see that the right ventricle was dilated, the interventricular septum was straightened, and there was tricuspid regurgitation. Follow up, again there is some pulmonary embolism that you can see. The RV is still a bit dilated but getting better and then later on follow up the pulmonary embolism has resolved. The RV size has gone back to normal. The tricuspid regurgitation has also gone down in there. So MRI is great because we can use it for serial follow up of these patients in a manner where there is no exposure to radiation. The other parameters which can be helpful in MRI include delayed enhancement imaging where you can see fibrosis and also what we call as mapping sequences. This is something uh, new in MRI which is very well adopted in the Western world and slowly getting adopted in India called as the 4D flow where we can assess the flow across each vessel and to look for pressures and strain there which will again help us in calculating the pulmonary arterial pressures. So in summary, I would like to say that it is very, very important to know the classification system of pulmonary hypertension. Here I have labeled all the causes of pulmonary hypertension, the group which they belong to and what are the findings that you can see on imaging. Just take a photo of the screen and you can use this as a ready reckoner for you. Imaging is of paramount importance. Every CT scan you look for First thing you look and see if there is pulmonary hypertension or not. Second, you look at the pulmonary arteries for clots. Then you look for any shunts. Then you look at pulmonary veins for the pulmonary venous return. Look at the heart and make sure that there is no ASD or VSD. Then look at the lungs. Then look at the liver to make sure that the liver is fine. MRI has got great potential in following up of these patients and to non-invasively assess these patients. Remember, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and shunts are pathologies which can be treated and will have good results. Also, if you see septal lines, think about PCH and PVOD. 
Thank you very much for your kind attention.